Well, hello, friends. Uh, as you can see, this is not a live event with my wife. Now, someone might ask the question, Richard, are the live events, the Bible Q&As, are they coming back to Thursday nights? Well, the answer to that, folks, is yes. Mm. Excuse me. Yes, they are. Last Thursday, my wife and son, Ricky, they were in Maryland, and I was here by myself, and I chose to do a recorded Bible message, and I uploaded that. Uh, this week and next week, my wife is uh, busy teaching a class kind of thing to homeschool moms for our homeschool group, and she will be busy next week. She's busy this week. So after next week, the week after that, we should, Lord willing, begin the Bible Q&As again on Thursday nights. But to put up something, I thought, you know, I had an idea for a, a video tonight, and I hope that it will be a blessing to someone. Uh, tonight, I am going to uh, share with you my salvation testimony, my personal salvation testimony, or I, another title I wrote down, how Richard Beale, that's me, became a Christian, okay? And I like to share that for many reasons. You know, when you're talking to people about the Lord, the, the number one message that you should always have to give is how you became a, a child of God. You know, it, you're, if you're going to talk to someone else about becoming a Christian, a child of God, then you should be able to explain to that person how you trusted the Lord. So that's a reason why, that's a reason why I give my salvation testimony. Another one, I just want some coffee tonight. Another one is this. Uh, we do a lot of social media, my wife and I. And it is a fact that most of the people that follow us on social media know us from the internet, but they don't really know us in person here, face to face, you know, they don't really know us here, they know us there, if that makes sense, on, on the computer, on the cell phone. So I, I appreciate and I'm very um, excited that people watch us do these little uh, Q&As and, and messages and all online, but I, I understand that people really need to know who it is that they're listening to. I mean, I would expect if I'm going to give you any kind of Bible lesson, teaching, preaching, you would want to know where I stand as far as Christ, as far as the Bible. You would want to know certain things, I, I would assume. So to help uh, ease your mind, possibly, of uh, who you're listening to, I'll give you my salvation testimony of when I uh, met the Lord when I trusted the Lord as my Lord and Savior, when I uh, became a Christian. So, all that just to say this. I, I boil it down to two points tonight. Two points tonight. And, I, I'll give you a little heads up. I'll, I'll project ahead a little bit. It will be followed up. This video will be followed up by a second video. Okay? where I, I go on from, uh, I explain what happened after I got saved, okay? So I'm going to do a little video on my salvation testimony, yes, and I just want coffee tonight. And then uh, the next video will be what happened immediately after, or the days that followed after I got saved, okay? So that's that. So you, you, we're all on the same page here. Okay, that was enough introduction. My Salvation Testimony, How Richard Beale Became a Christian, right now. I've said before on live events and videos, uh, there was a period of my life years ago, it began I guess in my teenage years, where I developed a, quite a terrible depression. Uh, those of you that have been depressed, you understand that it's different 
than just having good days and bad days. Depression, real depression. I mean, it is serious. It is like this weight that you cannot shake and it weighs you down. I mean, this absolute hopelessness is what it is. It just, and I carried it all the time. Uh, I was around many times people that were joyful and happy, but I was just in my own personal misery and I couldn't shake it. There was nothing I could do to get rid of it. Uh, so I think of my years of depression. It really brought me to the Lord. Uh, just to stop there and, and say this, it was through my depression that the Lord Jesus got my attention. He let me go very low, so eventually I would look up and see him. And I know that's what happened. Because if I had had it easy and great, I, I know I would have been puffed up in pride and everything. Because I was a little cocky as a kid sometimes. Sometimes I was cocky. And I think if I had just had a great experience in my teenage years and 20s and everything, I think that maybe I would have pushed aside my need for God and I would never have considered Jesus Christ. So to say all that to say this, I'm very thankful, and it might sound weird to someone, but I'm being honest, I'm thankful for my years of depression because it was through that depression I realized I needed Christ. I needed someone I, I, need the, I needed the help of someone, and it was God himself. So, you know, I've said before to people, and I'll say it again, that anything that the Lord uses, uh, no matter how bad it is in your life, no matter how hard it is and painful it is, whatever the Lord uses to get your attention, to help you see that you need him, you can rejoice. It's a good thing. And depression is misery. Depression is hard. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anyone should willingly go through a, for, through a years of depression. You know, avoid depression. But I'll say this. If you are depressed, the Lord might be using it to get your attention. He might be allowing you. You say, does the Lord even love me? I'm depressed. How can God love me? I'm going through all this depression. Maybe the Lord is allowing this great depression in your life to happen, to get your attention, to bring you so low that you will look up and see him and see the help that he gives, okay? Maybe the Lord is trying to get your attention and he was trying to get mine. So years now, years now, I went through a depression. Teen, teenage years, all the way through my mid-twenties. And it was rough. It was bad. And, I mean, through those years, I was suicidal. Many days, I just wanted to die. I did not want to wake up. Uh, all day long, I would, I would just be in, in, in just absolute, just agony in my heart. And uh, go to sleep at night just hoping I didn't wake up the next day. And I, I spent years like that. And of course, that kind of depression, sadness affects your relationships. I carried that around and I, I was a teenager at home. And I know, I know it hurt my relationship with my mother. Uh, back then, my mom, my mom was a housewife, so I was around her a lot. Uh, when my dad was at work and I would just I would just pour out my heart to my mom and she did not know how to help me you know how, how can you help somebody that's so uh, just just down she didn't know how she wanted to but she couldn't and I, I know it hurt my relationship with my mom back then and they did what they could they put me in therapy all right they put me in therapy a lot of teenagers and all, and people older years go to go and get a therapist, and they go in and they schedule the appointment, and they go and they talk to somebody. And folks, I'm not looking down on that, um, but I, I will say this: I didn't get helped. I went in, and the woman was trying to talk to me about what was going on in my life, and my troubles, and my feelings, and everything. And I tell you what, I was I just put up a wall. I couldn't talk to her. I wouldn't talk to her. And eventually, she pulled my mother in on the second session and told my mother, she said, I can't help him. 
you know, right in front of me, right in front of me. I'm the depressed one who's falling apart. Right in front of me, she says, I cannot help him. He won't talk to me. And I, I wouldn't. I, I did. I put up that wall. You know, I was not talking to anybody. I was just dealing with this, this inner misery. So the therapy didn't work. And uh, skipping, skipping, skipping. Years later, I, I meet my wife. I was a teenager then, but I met my wife. And uh, we got together. And, and I know I'm skipping a bunch. But all through all these years, I was still depressed. Uh, we, we got married, we had kids. I mean, there was a time that we were married. We had Brianna, we had Ricky, we had Brian. We were living in a, in a, in a home in Maryland. And there, there was a lot of good things happening to me. I can't say my life was falling apart. I had a job, I had a wife, I had a family, I, I, was, I had a home. And there, there were a lot of good things happening to me. But guess what? I was still miserable. It was inside. I could not shake it. I, I just felt dead inside. I think I wanted to kill myself because inside I already felt dead. Okay, maybe you can relate. Maybe you know someone who's like that. Jesus can help. Uh, so I was miserable. I was down. And yes, it, it hurt my relationship with my kids early on. It hurt my relationship with my wife. Because much like I, I would pour, when I was a teenager, I would pour out my depression on my mom. When I got married, I started pouring out my depression on my wife. Just, just, just really just begging. It was really begging her to help. I didn't know how to help myself. And I was just begging her, just like I begged my mom, just like I was begging anybody and everybody. Just, I need help. You know, and it was really a cry out for help. All the, you know. But she couldn't. And it did, early on, it did hurt my relationship with her. So, skipping ahead a little bit more. I did not want to give up. You know, I... I yeah, yeah it, it, on one hand, I, I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. But on the other hand, I knew that I had kids. And I had enough sense to know that I could not leave my kids. I did not want them to, to be raised without me. I did not want them to have to look back and say that their, their dad killed, killed himself. I wanted to be there for, for them. So I made a decision, no matter how hard it got in here with the depression, I was still going to stay around for them. So I did. So during that time of my life, when the kids were very small, even though I was depressed, I tried to better myself. I thought to myself, well, I can overcome this. Okay, I, I can fight through this and, and I, can get, um, I can get over this depression. Maybe a little bit I can lessen it. So I started doing some things. Okay, yellow legal pads. I went to the store and I bought some yellow legal pads. And I would begin each day trying to better myself. Uh, I've given examples before. I would have, back then I had a cussing problem. I used to cuss all the time. And I knew it was wrong. And I knew that when I was cussing, inside I just felt miserable. I felt like things were getting worse. I was having like a tantrum. I was just, you know, blowing up and cussing, and I knew it was bad. So I thought, well, one thing that might lessen my depression is I'll, I'll better my, my, my speech. So I got a dictionary. And I remember I, I would try to pick a, a, a very smart word in the dictionary. And a word that would make me sound intelligent. Okay? And on that legal pad... Each day I would write the word, I would write it out, the bad word, I would write the word that I did not want to use anymore. And with it, or beside it, I would write the word that I wanted to use. The smart word from the dictionary. So I, I would practice that, trying to fix my, my speech, my words, my vocabulary, and other things like that, just to try to better myself. I got very interested in self-help materials reading materials and things. I would watch 
uh, things, if I could ever find something on television about self-help, you know, better yourself kind of stuff, I would read things about self-help. Uh, if we ever went to the store uh, with the kids when they were little, I, if we went to a bookstore, I would always go into the self-help section and look and read, just, you know, flip through. And I was just trying to come up with ideas. How Richard Beale could better himself to lessen this monster of depression. Uh, I went through my exercise phase. You know, throughout my life, I went through several exercise phases. I did it as a teenager, and then I did it again in my 20s, and then I did it again in my 30s, and I want to now, but, you know, <sighs> no comment. Anyway, so then I went through a little exercise phase, because, you know, people always say exercise does lift the spirit, lift the mood, and help with depression. And I will say this, you know, if you're struggling with that idea, depression is serious, and exercise actually does help. You know, Christians can be depressed. We'll talk about that another time. But even as a Christian, you can be depressed. And exercise, it does help. It does help, and it sharpens the body. And this is the tool that you use for the Lord, that God uses and uh, it's good to keep it as strong as you possibly can. But enough of that. I try to exercise to lessen my depression. And folks, that didn't work. The self-help materials I was reading didn't work. Uh, the legal pads and all the little trying to change my vocabulary did not work. And then the exercise. Man, exercise is good, but I was trying to do away with depression. And it just did not work. Okay? And then, yes, I went down a, even a, a bad road to try to overcome depression or maybe dull it, ignore it, maybe. You know what the world does. Many people try to do it. They go down a road of, you know, drinking and drugs and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I tell you what, I don't try to hold up sin, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. For a brief period of my life, I went down that road trying to just dull it, to ignore it to lessen it, okay? Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I started uh, smoking cigarettes. Um, I would not smoke them around the children. I would go outside and I would wash you know, up as much as I could and change my clothes, but hey, I was smoking at least a pack a day for a couple years. Just, just, you know, just to have something to do to lessen depression. When I um, turned 21, I went and bought a bottle of alcohol. Alcohol, I, yes I did. And I never really took to that. I will be honest, uh, I took to the cigarettes a lot more than the, than the drinking. I just wasn't a big fan of it. But I try to keep it going because, you know, just that dumb worldly mindset where you think that, you know, a lot of people think that that will get them over the hump of depression. It won't. It just makes it worse. It really does. It just makes it worse. And it made it worse for me. So during the day, and then I got involved. I mean, I started um, smoking cigars too. Cigars. Ugh. But I did. All right. So during the day when I was at work and stuff, I, was, I would smoke cigarettes. And then at night, after the kids went to sleep, I, I would get out my bottle of alcohol and I would get out my cigars. And I would go, I'd take a kitchen chair out to the porch and I would sit there. No cat town back then. Now I just watch cats. I just watch cats now. I don't, I don't mess with all that kind of junk. I just watch the cats. But back then, no cats. I had, I had my alcohol and my cigar and, and I would sit there and I would try to like, is this going to make you happy, Richard? Is this how you overcome depression? I mean, I was trying and found Failure every step of the way. That's not the way to overcome depression. So my legal pads didn't work. My self-help stuff didn't work. The exercise didn't work. And my little brief period of time with the alcohol and the cigar cigars and the cigarettes, folks, that didn't work either. It did not work. So I wrote down in my notes, because I wrote down a few notes for this. So I tried to be bad to overcome the depression and feel better. It didn't work. I tried to be good. You know, I try to better myself to overcome depression and stuff. And that didn't work either. Okay? I couldn't shake it. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And if you've been depressed, you understand what I'm saying. It's a weight. And you just cannot get it off your back. Right? And uh, I, I, something else I want to bring up 
so during that time, I told you I was I was very interested in reading the self help materials and things. I was in a store, and I saw a book. And I'll show it to you in a minute. It's called 100, 100 Ways to Overcome Depression. 100 Ways to Overcome Depression. And I thought, oh, that's what I need. I need 100 ways to overcome depression. Because I've already come up with about four or five or six, and none of them are working. 100 ways, that sounds great. What are these ways? And I got the book. And I, I didn't open it. I didn't look at it. I just, I, I got, I got the book uh, just because of the title, just because of the title. And I remember going home and looking at it. And in it, it's filled with Bible verses and Bible helps. It's a Christian book, 100 Ways to Overcome Depression with the Bible, with, with really with God's help. Okay. But I, at that point, I had not considered the Bible. I had never even looked at a Bible. I mean, I was in my mid-20s. I did not know a single Bible verse. I did not grow up reading my, the Bible. I was not a Christian. Um, I didn't know anything about God. And God was not in my mind to overcome the darkness that I had all these years. So I'm looking at this book, and it's all these Bible verses and all in it. And I'm like, what in the world? A hundred ways to overcome depression. It's all this Bible stuff. What in the world is this? And and I'll read some of the things. It's um part one, developing a better relationship with God. Uh, and and I'd say this book is for Christians to overcome depression, because the number one thing you do is you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you become a Christian. And as a Christian, if you if you suffer with depression still. I would say part one, it says develop a better relationship with God. And then part two, focusing on Christ. Part three, focusing on God's word. Part four, uh, praying uh, for help and guidance. And then it's part five, avoiding sin and Satan. Drawing strength from others, part six. Part seven, dealing with... Uh, with, I guess, life patterns and things. I guess that's, you know, habits, bad habits, I guess. And it's a, it's a helpful little book. Now I can say that. Now I can say that as a Christian. But back then, I was like shocked. Let me show it to you. There it is. It's called 100 Ways to Overcome Depression. I've kept it all these years because for, for no other reason than just as a reminder of what I was back then. Every time I see it, every time I see it, I remember what I used to be. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, I had, I mean, like, I hold a Bible in my hand every day now. And I have for 13 years. But back then, when I saw this book, I had never really looked at a Bible. This book really kind of started my mind thinking about God. I didn't get saved because of this book, but I think the Lord started to get my attention right around this time when I found this. 100 ways to overcome depression, right there. And I'll probably keep that the rest of my life, just as a reminder. Okay, so, but I tell you, the, I got the book and I'm like, God, it says God all throughout. I'm like, what is this? How is this gonna help me with depression? I, I, I didn't understand it. And around that time, also people started to tell me at my job, uh, they, they knew I was down. They knew I was a complainer and I was a, just just miserable. They knew it. I mean, when, when you're depressed, folks, people around you know it. You think you can hide it, but you cannot. And I couldn't hide it. And people knew I was depressed. And there were people that would try to help me. I, I know they were probably trying to help, be honest. I, I knew they were trying to be kind to me. And they'd say, you know, Richard, you just need Jesus. You need Jesus. And I tell you what, they really wouldn't explain to me why I needed Jesus. I didn't I never got any Bible verses from them or anything. And I'm not trying to shoot at them. They were trying the best they could to help me. But they wouldn't explain to me why I needed Jesus. They just said, You need Jesus. And it kind of made me mad back then. I was just down and they're telling me I need Jesus. And I I felt in my heart, I felt like they were judging me. What do you mean I need Jesus? You need Jesus, you know? And 
I, I was just really aggravated with them telling me that. Uh, I needed some Bible is what I needed. But like I said, they were trying to help and I appreciate that. Again, I think the Lord was using what they were saying to get my attention because it at least planted a seed in my head. Even though I was mad about it, in my head I still thought, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Then my wife, Ricky and Brian were little, little, little boys. Uh, my wife will give her testimony hopefully one day, and maybe in a video. I'll ask her about it. Uh, she got saved, according to her own words, when she was a bus kid. Uh, you know, back then, churches did it a lot more. I, I, some churches do it now, but I know they used to do it a lot more back then go into a neighborhood with a bus many times the churches would buy school buses and things old ones and old school buses and they pick up some kids and you know that wanted to go to church and they take them to church and they uh, give them a bible lesson preach to them many times kids would get saved and then the buses would take the kids back to their homes and now the kids were christians you know and uh, my wife was a bus kid she she got picked up by a by a church on, on a school bus or so and uh, taken to church, gave a Bible lesson. She through all that she got saved, but she never really grew as a Christian because she just she she never attended church very much. She never learned that much. So she was a Christian, yes, but she was just not an educated Christian. Very smart woman, always been a smart woman, but as far as the Bible goes, she didn't know a whole lot. So anyway. In her own words, and, and, and this is true, and, and this is from my perspective, so the boys were little. She decided she wanted to start taking them to church, a church, church. And I was lost. I didn't know much about God, but all this stuff was happening, people bringing up God to me and everything. And I thought to myself, all right, you know what? I, I don't know anything about going to church and knowing God, but I am a father, and church is, I'm sure, a good place, and I wanted to teach my kids morals and values and how to be respectful and right and things and I thought okay yeah take them to church help them to learn some values and things and morals and it, it'll 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 be better them it'll, it'll do good for them you know so I was all for it even though I was not a Christian I thought yeah take them to church that's good that's good my wife started going and the Lord really got her heart and she really started to change for God uh, she changed a lot in her life. You know, I was lonely, and, and I know that sounds funny because I was, I was, you know, with her and everything. But I was just in that misery. I was just, I felt all alone because I was the only one suffering. I was lonely. I was miserable. I was just terrible every single day. You know what you're thinking, Richard? You must have been a fun person to be around. Exactly. I was not a fun person to be around. I do believe with my whole heart. That the Lord pressed on my wife's heart to stay with that man, you know, because uh, she stayed. She stayed, you know, through, through some hard times. I was not a pleasant person to be around. I know it. And she stayed. And uh, I think the Lord has blessed her a lot for that. Um, anyways, but she, she started reading her Bible a lot. Reading her Bible all the time. She started changing all kinds of things about her life. She changed the way she would dress. She changed her, you know, her wardrobe. She changed her music. We used to go for rides and all on my days off. Uh, Ricky would sleep in the car seat. You know, we would just go for a drive. I'd get a cup of coffee. We would just drive. And we always used to listen to all the little, you know, music stations and things, you know, worldly music and things like that. And, whatever it was new during the, that time, 90s music. And um, anyway, actually, that was actually early 2000s too. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, anyway. So she changed all of her radio stations in her car to Christian stations. And I'm like, what in the world is this? They're singing about God and stuff. I said, what is this? I, I almost choked on my coffee. I'm like, what are you listening to? But she was changing before my eyes. And I tell you what, I liked it. 
uh, but I didn't know that I liked it. I know that sounds weird. It was getting my attention. I didn't really want it, but I was curious, if that makes sense. I didn't want it, but I was curious. I was rebelling against it, but I was kind of watching what God was doing in her life. I said, something is happening to my wife. She's changing her clothes, what she listens to, her activities. She's reading the Bible all the time. She's praying. What is going on? And she was, she was going to every single service, every service in the church. She was going. Um, every single one. Sundays, I used to work on Sundays. I would not go to church on Sundays. I worked. She would go every single Sunday. Wow. Wednesday nights, I would go over to my mom's house for dinner. Uh, but she would take the kids to church. Wow. I'd go to mom's house by myself. She's at church with the kids. I'm like, wow. And she was getting my attention. And the Lord was using that to kind of open my eyes a little bit to, you know, that I needed something and it was someone. It was him. So my wife was going to church and things like that. And I was getting very curious. And I, like I said, I worked on Sundays. I worked every Sunday. And in my curiosity of what was she, she hearing at church, I started on the radio as I was driving to work, looking around on the dial for some kind of stations. Because I, I knew that she was listening to Christian stations. I knew they were out there. So I was trying to find them. I was trying to find them. Well, I came across this station. It was not a Christian station. But there was a church in the area that paid uh, to, to broadcast. And this is smart, folks. You want to get some lost people? This is smart. It was a public, worldly uh, music station. A church in the area would pay to put their sermons once a week on this station. So people like me would hear Bible. Okay? Now, I will say this, that I didn't hear a lot of Bible from this one church that was putting um, the uh, their, their, their messages out. But they, they did... They, I've listened to them a lot since, and they do put Bible on their messages. But what it was is the preacher was giving his salvation testimony. And they broke it up into several weeks worth of messages. Because they were only playing like 10, 15 minutes at a time. So for several weeks, I would purposely find that station and hear this preacher give his salvation testimony of when he got saved. And I was curious, because I really didn't know anything about any of this. So I'm driving to work every Sunday, and I'm trying to find this guy on the radio. He's talking about when he became a Christian and everything, and I heard that for several weeks. And uh, let me see. I was also, at night, when the kids were asleep, excuse me, my wife was at work, I was looking around. We had cable back then. That's how, that's how old we were. You know, it wasn't internet. It was cable. And I would try to find some of the religious programs, and I would try to find some preachers. Uh, and you got to be careful with that stuff. And that not not everybody on television that seems spiritual is really giving you a clear gospel presentation. So not all of it's good. Some of it might be, but not all of it's good. And I was just listening to anything. I was just desperate. I was trying to find something. I was curious. And uh, I tell you, right, right around that time, it was Christmas time, uh, it came up. And the church that she was going to at the time, the church she was going to at the time had a Chris, Christmas play, a Christmas play. And she invited me, and I never went. I never went. Not one, I never went to this church, really. But for the special occasion, with my kids and all, I went. It was a, it was a Christmas evening. And the preacher preached. And... I, I often have said that I got saved the first time I heard the Bible preached, and that's true. I'm, I'm not shooting at this man. All right? Understand, I am not shooting at this man. I'm sure he gave some Bible, but I don't re remember any Bible. Uh, I just remember him talking about Jesus. And he put a thought in my head, the Lord did plant a seed, because I'd had those people that I told you about at other times tell me I needed Jesus. Well, he explained more than I had heard up to that point about Jesus um, um, uh, dying for me or dying for people, okay? Uh, and things like that, the sacrifice Jesus made. I heard more that night than I had heard up to that point. 
So the, it it kind of it kind of I put it up here. And but I went away that night knowing it was Christmas it was Christmas time, knowing that Jesus uh, died for sinners, but I wasn't saved yet. Uh, I was not saved yet. I hadn't trusted him for myself. Okay, I was still miserable. I was still depressed. I was still lost. I was still by myself spiritually and and just my own personal. And I'm not cussing. I'm being honest. I was in my own personal hell. Okay, it was just it was real. It was miserable. And I tell you, with that same church, uh, they went to see the Passion of the Christ. You remember that? So this kind of dates when all this was happening. So it was Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson made this movie about um, the the last uh, moments of Christ and when he went to the cross and everything. And it was the Passion of the Christ. And I went to see it at the theater, uh, at the movie theater when it was brand new. And like I said, I was still not a Christian. I was still lost. And I went to see it. And if you've seen it, you understand it's kind of hard to sit through. It, 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 there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, blood and stuff. And as a Christian, I understand that the cross was when Jesus shed his blood. And it was bloody. And I, I will say that. And I'm not offended by the blood by any means. Because I understand now as a Christian that the blood is what washed away my sins. But as a, as a, as a non-Christian at that time, I'm looking and thinking, wow, this is brutal. This is brutal. And understand this, folks. That was just an actor in a movie in Hollywood. The reality is it was much worse than that. The Lord experienced hell for us. He went through all kinds of torture and misery and pain for us. Okay, It was much worse than anything Hollywood could ever produce. And my Savior went through that. But I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I went through the, uh, watched the movie there, and it, it hit me then also that Jesus died for sinners. And I thought, wow, I even called my mom on the phone. My mom, she had no idea what I was talking about, but I, I just, mom, I can't believe the Lord did that for, for people. But I was still not a Christian because I, I, I knew Jesus died for sinners, but I hadn't trusted him personally. Okay, I hadn't actually, you know, sought the Lord to save me. I just had a head knowledge. I just knew in a general sense he died for sinners, but I hadn't made that connection that, hey, you died for Richard Beale and I need to be saved. So I was still lost. I was still confused. I, I was just getting little bits and pieces along the way of who Christ was and what he did for me and what he did for uh, all of mankind, right? But I went to see the Passion and left lost. And, and anyway, it was right around that time my wife uh, started going to another church. And what had happened there is kind of interesting. I had mentioned that she got saved as a bus kid when she was younger. Well, the church that she was going to when she got saved as a bus kid that church has a Christian school with it. There's a Christian academy within the church. And the secretary of that Christian academy lived on our street. And my wife and our kids would talk to her and her kids. And they were all, you know, in the evening talk. And she brought it up and said, oh, yeah, you know, I used to go there. And I, I don't really know how the conversation went. But more or less, that's what happened. The mom started to talk. Any of y'all moms ever talk? My wife talked. And before I knew it, before I knew it, you know, I, I, we put our boys in that Christian school. The public school, they were going to public school back then. And uh, you say, well, I thought y'all homeschool. We do. Oh, and my wife is finishing up homeschooling with my daughter. But there was, it's been a progression, okay? My, the boys started out in public school. Then they went to this Christian school and then my wife started to homeschool after this and I know I'm jumping ahead and then when we moved to North Carolina for one year she taught in a Christian school and they went to that school and then after that year she finished out her time or she's finishing out her time now with Brianna homeschooling okay so it's boom 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 that's that's the timeline but at this time we, we, we they were in a public school Brian and Ricky were 
and they, the public school had gotten a new principal and the principal was not getting along with many of the parents and there was like this friction in the school and it was bad. Now, I remember, I mean, our kids were little, but I remember just picking them up in the afternoon and there was just the morale in that school. It was just yucky, yucky, okay? And at that time, my wife brought up this Christian school and I'm like, I already thought church was a good thing. You know, take the kids, teach them morals. It'll be good for them. I thought, okay, a Christian school. Hey, that, that might be all right. Could we afford it? Maybe, I don't know. But if we can afford it, hey, take them to the Christian school. All right, I'm all for that. We went in for an interview, you know, just like a, I don't know what you call it. We went in, met with the principal of the Christian school. We walked around, looked at the school, and saw the students, you know, you know, in, in their Christian uniforms and everything, looking all sharp and right. And I thought, you know, this is not a bad place. This is pretty good. You know, I, I think Brian and Ricky would be good here. So we put him in the Christian school, okay? And uh, I, I'll tell you what, it was all that that led to my decision to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay, it was all these years of depression, all these years where the Lord was gently trying to bring me to Him, gently trying to get my attention. And then all this kind of hit me at once when we put our kids in a Christian school. I'll tell you what, that school I know trains kids in just the simple things of, you know, math and history and all, you know, it's a school. But the Lord used that Christian school as an evangelistic tool because it got this lost dad. And, and, and it was through that school that I eventually got saved. And I'll explain that. Um, the boys got saved, Brian and Ricky did, uh, a few months before I did. Uh, that church, like I said, that has the Christian school, my wife started going to it. During the summer months, they had a VBS or VBT, they call it, Vacation Bible Time, Vacation Bible School. You know, a lot of churches, churches have that. Brian and Ricky went to that. It was during that time they heard the Bible, uh, gospel preached. And as young kids, as young boys, they got saved. And I'm having dinner one night, and Ricky tugs on this arm. And looks at me in my eyeballs after he was saved and looks at me in my eyeball, eyeballs and says, Daddy, I wish you'd get saved. And I, I'm like, I got a little heated. I'm like, what are you talking about? I hadn't, I, I'd be honest with you, I never heard the word. It's in the Bible. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's in the Bible. But I'd never heard it. Not used in, in, in a spiritual uh, uh, context, context, meaning delivery and um i said like, i don't know what you're talking about He's saved but he said i want to get i mean my he my son ricky at that age i mean he was young you know he's what first grade first grade he's already being a soul winner trying to win his dad to the christ anyway so anyhow the lord used them to get my attention the lord was using my wife um what had happened was, so this was early on, this was like September, something like that. The kids are now in the school. That October, October, 13 years ago, on a Monday night, okay, my wife tells me that the church is having a revival. You know, the, the church had a Christian school. But it was also a church. So, you know, they were a church. And uh, they were having revival. I did not know what a revival was, what revival meetings were about. I didn't know any of that. She just told me they're having church at night. I'm like, okay, they're having revival. Great. She said to me, she said, if your children are in the academy, the Christian school, the parents are expected to go to the revival in the church. And I said, all right, fine, I'll go. I, I, I said, it's my, you know, in my heart, I'm thinking, it's my parental duty. I'm their dad. They're in that school. I'll go. I'll go. I didn't want to go, but I said I'd go. And, uh, oh, my. So I went. It was a Monday night. I said, I can't go Sunday. I worked. I worked at the time. So I said, I'll go Monday night. The revival was 
was Sunday morning, Sunday morning all the way to Friday night, all the whole week. So I said, I'll go Monday night. My wife worked a job at the time outside the home. And she, she, she was off, and we were going to go, all five of us. And at the last minute, at the last minute, her job called her in. Said, you got to work tonight. So she went, and she looked at me, she said, you still going to take them? And I said, I'll take them, I'll take them. So here I am, the lost dad who's uncomfortable about church. I mean, I, I don't go to church. <laughs> but to do my parental duty, I said, I'll take them. Okay? So I drove the 40 minutes. I mean, it was a long ways to get to a good Bible preaching church. You know, I, I didn't realize what made that church different. I mean, they preached the Bible. Uh, it was a good church. It still is. But it was 40 minutes away. So I drove the 40 minutes to get there. And uh, I'll tell you what, I walk in. The boys were much younger, of course. Brianna was nursery age. So I, I felt like I was just going to hide behind the kids. I, you know, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was a little uncomfortable around church people. <laughs> you know, I, I, now I am one, so I'm not trying to be offensive. I am a church person now. But back then, I was, I was really nervous around church people. I knew I had a cussing problem. And I didn't want to speak because I didn't know what was going to come out. I, I didn't know what to say to be, these people. I, I just, I was uncomfortable. So I figured I hide, I'll hide behind my kids. But my daughter went to the nursery. She was nursery age. My wife had already told me, take her to the nursery. So I said, here you go. It's my daughter. Do you know who she is? They already knew who she was. My wife was already going to the church. They said, oh, it's Brianna. Hey. And then they took Brianna. I said, all right, good. I'll, I'll see you after church. So I had my boys. I said, at least I got my boys. I'll hide behind them. So I put them out in front of me. And I walked into the auditorium really quick. And I sat one here and one here. I sat in the pew. I sat one here and one here. And, and that way, no, one, no one's going to sit beside me. No one's going to bother me. Everybody wanted to shake my hand and meet me. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a, a fairly big church. It still is. But the visitor, the new guy, stands out. You know, if you go to church, you understand, you see the new people. And I'm doing my best to avoid meeting and greeting all these people. And I got to meet and, and, and know a lot of them before we left Maryland for North Carolina. And they were all wonderful people, and many of those people are still there. And they're great people. Uh, very godly, faithful folks. But I didn't know that. It didn't mean anything to me at that time. And I was just trying to avoid conversation. So I was focusing on the boys, Ricky and, and, uh, and uh, Brian there. And I was trying to be the dad. Well, I think the Lord knew that if I had family with me, I would focus on the family and not the Bible preached. And God and his wisdom, he, you know, God can do anything. And God worked and he removed my distractions. I think that's why my wife had to work that night. If my wife was there, I would have focused on her and pretty much hid behind her and not listen to the preaching. So he, he had her work that night. If my daughter was there, I would have focused on her. So the Lord had my daughter go to the nursery. If those boys had stayed with me, I would have focused on them and not the preaching. So guess what God did? The preacher got up and he announced that we were, they were dismissing the children to the children's service. They had a preacher there to preach a, 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 a message for children to the children, okay? So the boys, Ricky and Brian, got up and they left me. There, there they were. I was hiding behind them pretty much, you know, one there and one there. And they, 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 both of them got up and they said, we'll see you after church. And they took off. I'm like, wow, I didn't know they were leaving. So guess what? Now I'm by myself. And I'm like, well, I wasn't planning on this. My wife had promised that all five of us were going to church. And I didn't want to go. So I was going to go. I said, I'll go with the four of you. All of them left me. The Lord moved them all aside so he could get my attention, my full attention. That night, my wife, or that afternoon, my wife had given me a Bible. She went to a Christian bookstore. She bought a Bible. She gave it to me to take to the church. So in my hands, I was holding a brand new Bible. Still smelled new, right? And I still have that Bible. I'll show it to you sometime. So I had, I had it in my hands. And I didn't know how to find anything. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I really didn't. And, uh, but, the, but I'm sitting there. 
And, and when, when the boys left, I realized at that point, I was like three rows back. I was pretty much dead center in the front. I mean, there were people around me, but I was like right in front of the pulpit and the preacher, three rows back. I'm like, wow, you know, and he, he, he was not, he was not a loud yelling preacher, but he was a clear and, and he had a lot of bass in his voice. He could talk, you know, and uh, he probably didn't need the microphone. But anyhow, so I'm sitting there, I'm hearing every word. And finally, after all these years, finally, I'm hearing that I need Jesus, but I'm hearing Bible. He's telling me uh, all these things that I've heard for years, but the difference is the preacher was giving Bible verses to back up everything he was saying. And the Bible got my attention. And I've said this a thousand times and I'll continue to say it. When you tell somebody about Christ, that they need Jesus, make sure you know some Bible. You don't need to know the whole thing. If you're, if you're a new believer and you want to share your faith with someone, you don't need to know the whole thing. But I tell you, you should know how you got saved. And you should be able to explain that using Bible verses. Because it's the Bible. According to the book of Jeremiah, the Bible breaks the hard heart of a sinner. And that's what happened to me that night. The preacher was just preached. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And he was just going on verse after verse. And, and, and God got my attention. The Holy Spirit really broke this hard heart. And I realized that night that I was in bad spiritual shape. I, I was in trouble. Uh, and the depression had gotten to the point that I was as low as I could possibly get. Remember, I was still suicidal. I was just deciding to stick around because I wanted to raise my kids. I mean, I was just down every single moment. I was down. Remember, this is the depression that brought me to uh, trying to better myself, and that didn't work. Brought me to uh, uh, smoking and drinking a little bit, and that didn't work. And I mean, it was bad. And I'm sitting there, and, and finally... With the Bible being preached, I realized that I needed help, but it wasn't the help that I was looking for. It was different. The help that I needed was God. And uh, it hit me hard that night. The Lord did it. He really got me, you know. And I, I, I thought, okay, I need God. I need God. And the preacher asked a question that night many preachers ask it i've asked it myself at times to people and uh but it's if you died tonight this was the question if you died tonight are you 100 percent certain that you'd go to heaven and folks i'll be honest with you i was suicidal and i was thinking that if i died all the pain of this life would be gone i'd be in a better place everything would be great you know, I was assuming I'd go to heaven, assuming, hoping for the best, but I did not know for sure. The preacher said, do you know for sure? And I'm like, well, I'm hoping, I think so, fingers crossed, but I don't know for sure. And the preacher said, would you like to know for sure? I mean, he's talking to everybody, but I'm hearing it. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to know for sure. And, uh, you know, there's actually a verse in 1 John that says that these things, things in this book, were written so you could know for sure. And I'm like, yeah, I want to know for sure. How can I know for sure if I died tonight, I'd be in heaven? And he ran through, in front for everybody, but I was listening to it, uh, he ran through a simple gospel presentation explaining the decision, it's a faith decision now, that one must make in order to go to heaven to find forgiveness of sin. And I listened closely to that decision. What is this decision about? You know, I've heard for years now I needed Jesus. How do I get Jesus? I've heard for years that I need Jesus. Why do I need Jesus? You know, you're telling me I need to make a decision. What are the details of this decision? And the preacher went through a very simple plan. And I hung on to every word. Every word of this word, the Bible. And I'll tell you what. 
uh, after he got done explaining who Jesus is and why I need him, you know, he explained from the Bible that if you just simply trust him with faith, your faith, my faith, and call on him and ask him, really, it's just with faith, you ask him to save you, to forgive you, and he hears you, and he does. He saves you. He forgives you, and you become his child, and you, you have that home in heaven. It's simply just ask for it. It's a gift, and, and God gives it as a gift. And, uh, and that night, after, after he explained it from the Bible, I got saved. And uh, I, I know it was, a lot, it was not a religious experience. It was a reality with a clear mind and a humble heart that was just looking for something else. I called out for Jesus to help me and to forgive me and asked him to let me be his child and give me that home in heaven. And folks, the Lord heard me. And I know that because this Bible explains that it's just a faith decision and that he's listening. The Lord heard me. I got saved that night. I got saved that night. And uh, I just simply called on the Lord with faith. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, everything changed. You know, everything changed that night. My eyes were open. And that's Bible too, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God in that moment. It wasn't 10 minutes. It was that moment that I trusted Christ and I called on him in that split second. The Lord came into my life, and He's been with me. I've been His child every day, every moment for the past 13 years. And I'll never lose it, and I'll always be His child. And I'll tell you what, you talk about purpose, you talk about joy, you talk about a reason to get up in the morning. I'll tell you what, it all changed that night. If you have been experiencing a lot of depression... Man, I know there's a lot of reasons, causes of depression, and I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there aren't other helps for depression. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying in my case, the depression was real, it was there, and it was Jesus Christ himself who was the answer. I'm saying right now, if you've tried all kinds of ways to get rid of depression, and none of them have worked, try Jesus. Because he, he worked, for, it worked for me. You know, he was the cure for depression in my life. And I'm sure he'd be the uh, help with the cure for you. Uh, try him. Try him out. I'll tell you what, he's there. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, the Bible says. And, well, I'll tell you what, from this point on, I'm going to give just a little brief breakdown of the decision that I made that night. A little brief breakdown. Just like the preacher explained to me 13 years ago. Okay, here's the Bible. In the Bible, we read how you can know God, uh, how you can have your sins forgiven, how you can go to heaven. Okay, I'm going to say a couple phrases and then we're going to go back. Number one, we're sinners. Number two, sinners have a penalty that must be paid. Number three, Jesus Christ himself already paid that penalty for you. Okay, number four, to accept the gift that he paid the penalty, that you can have forgiveness of sin in a home in heaven because of him paying this penalty for you, all you need to do is with faith, call on Christ and ask him for it. You're a sinner, you owe a penalty, he paid the penalty. So all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I believe you paid the penalty. I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me. And folks, with that decision, with that decision, you become a Christian, you become his child, you're redeemed, you're saved, you have that home in heaven. Uh, I'll tell you, he enters your life, okay? But let me give you the Bible. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. You know, you and I, we have fallen short of God's glory. All right? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? We're sinners. There's a problem with our sin. 
there's a payment that is required because of our sin and it's death the penalty for sin is death the wage for sin is death and that's bad news for a sinner right but there is good news you jump over to Romans 5 8 and I'm reading to you from the Bible Romans 5 8 but God commendeth just a word that means demonstrated God demonstrated he showed his love toward us toward everybody in that while while we were yet sinners Christ died for us so God showed his love for us and that while we're yet sinners with that penalty Christ died for us he died the death that we deserve he paid our penalty for us it's like an electric bill you have it you don't have the money you can't pay it Christ came along and paid the electric bill he paid the water bill you had a sin debt you had a sin bill the Lord Jesus paid it okay he paid it with his own blood on the cross he shed his blood to wash away the sin okay now how do you accept it it's not automatic he died for you he paid the penalty but to be saved to become his child you have to trust that he did that for you it's it's when it goes from being a head knowledge see for a while there you know when i was going to the other church and seeing the passion of the christ in the movie theater i had a head knowledge i knew christ died for sinners but the night i was saved i realized he died for richard beale and i trusted him as my personal lord and savior it wasn't that he died for everybody that night he died for me and i trusted him personally it's quite possible you know christ died for sinners but you're not saved he hasn't done anything in your life you're not you're confused why the christian life is so hard to live because you don't have christ yet you have a head knowledge but you haven't made it personal folks getting saved you can't get much more personal than that it's a personal decision between your heart and the heart of christ you ask him personally to save you you trust what he did on the cross for you not your wife not your husband not your kids to get saved you trust what he did on the cross for you and you make a personal decision to trust christ to be your lord and personal savior and it happens in a moment you're saved you're born again you're redeemed the bible says in romans 10 13 let me see 10 13 for whosoever anybody at all could be you tonight was me 13 years ago for whosoever shall call a call of help a call for help a call of desperation you know it's like and i've said before it's like you're in a burning building you can't get out you call for the fireman you're sinking in water you can't get out you call for the lifeguard you realize that you're a sinner with a penalty and you need help and you call on christ to save you okay for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord jesus christ folks shall be saved say it with me romans 10 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved can you remember a time in your life when you called on christ i don't know how long you can go back a year two years ten years when you were a kid maybe can you remember a time in your life when you saw yourself as a sinner you realized christ was the savior and you called on him for his salvation his rescue from sin have you called on Christ? Have you trusted him personally? Can you remember a time? If you cannot, make tonight that time. If you have doubts, make tonight the night of your salvation. Call on Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Just with a simple trusting heart, bow your head. And, and I'll tell you, there are no magic words. It's simply calling on Christ. You can pray something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe you're God. As God, you died on the cross for my sins. You shed your blood to wash away my sins. And you were raised again. You're alive today. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll forgive me of my sins. Give me a home in heaven. I'm trusting you and only you to get me to heaven. 
And Lord Jesus, I, I want to be born again and be your child. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing this prayer and saving my soul. I'm putting all my faith, hope, and trust in you and only in you. Amen. Again, folks, I will say that there are no magic words. I don't have written down prayers. It's simply calling on Christ with faith. That's all it is. A simple call on Christ with a heart of faith in Him and what He did for you on the cross. And folks, i tell you what. If you're somebody and you did not know you were a, a, a believer, maybe you had doubts, and you just now called on Christ, and you meant it, and you put your faith honestly in Him and Him alone, based on this Bible, based on Romans 10, 13, you are a child of God. You are a Christian. Because all it is is a simple faith decision. And if, that, if that's a decision you made tonight, I rejoice with you. Amen. That's wonderful. That's a decision that I made 13 years ago, and I've never regretted it. I never will. And you won't either. And that is an amen. Okay? And with that, that was my salvation testimony. That's when I got saved, when Richard Beale became a Christian. And that was, I said, that was talking about my depression, the years of depression that brought me to Christ. And that was the decision I made to trust Him as my Lord and Savior. And my next video will be the days after, the days that followed after I got saved. I'll discuss that a little bit on the next video. But I tell you, I thank you for watching this one. And let me also say what I said at the beginning. If you're going through a depression or some kind of trouble or anything like that, understand this. If you're not a Christian, the Lord might be allowing you to go through all that trouble to get your attention so you'll realize that you need something else. You need Him. If you are a Christian, the Lord might still be allowing you to go through all that trouble to remind you of the God that saved you, that you need Him every single day. Folks, I tell you what, if you're not a believer, trust Him tonight. Hope you just did, but if you're still on the fence, trust Him tonight. And if you're, you are a believer, be wonderfully reminded of Christ, that He loves you, that He wants to work in your life. And I'll tell you, click off this video and give Him praise and glory and just pray to Him tonight and just tell Him how much you love Him. Okay? He loves you. Thank you for watching this video. It was my salvation testimony. God bless you.